Well, we give uh, everybody a warm welcome on a chilly evening. And uh, it may be that you're watching us on YouTube. You may not be here in Chartridge. You may be in the furthest corners of the earth, tuning in online to Chartridge Mission Church. We give you a welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus. We're going to begin by reading a psalm together. Psalm 106, or part of it. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? Blessed are they who maintain justice, who constantly do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favour to your people. Come to my aid when you save them, that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share in the joy of your nation and join your inheritance in giving praise. We have sinned, even our fathers did. We have, not, we have done wrong and acted wickedly. When our fathers were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, to his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe. From the hand of the enemy, he redeemed them. The waters covered their adversaries and one of them, not one of them survived. Then they believed his promises and sang his praise. But they soon forgot what he had done. May we not forget what he has done. We're going to turn to the word of God tonight, to the book of Titus. Titus 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God and the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And now we'll um, uh, go to chapter 2. And uh, for the sake of time, we'll just read verse 1. He says, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love and endurance. We will read on. And then he says in verse 3, likewise teach the older women. And verse 4, then they can train the younger women. In verse 6, similarly, encourage the young men. And in verse 9, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. Chapter 3. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and to show true humility 
toward all men. At one time, we too were foolish and disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasure. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Titus. Uh, I was saying to someone recently um, that uh, I had been asked uh, to uh, speak this evening, to preach, and they said, and what are you going to preach on? So I said, well, my title is The Gospel Leads to Godliness. Oh, where from? Titus. Well, we don't hear Titus very often. So I said, no, that's why I want to preach on it, because we don't hear it very often. And we sometimes beat around in Romans and the Gospels, and we forget half of the Old Testament and all the interesting bits of Scripture. So I feel we should be widening our brief as we think about the Word of God. Now, that's not a criticism of those who come and preach, we appreciate what God puts on their hearts, but we have 66 books to, have a, to look at. Many of you will know that um, I live in Beaconsfield. Uh, it's no accident, it was of the Lord. Many years ago, we had lived in um, the uh, USA and we came back to this country uh, without a house and so the question was we would have to rent a house but where should we live uh, well I was working at the time uh, locally and uh, we looked around all over the Chilterns and we went to see this house and that house and we couldn't um, find anything suitable until one day there was an advert in the paper for a new bungalow that had just been built to rent in Beaconsfield. So we took that and we went to live there. And we got to like the place and eventually we settled there. Now I mention that because Beaconsfield is a place where has been, it has been the home of several authors. If I was to step out of my front gate turn right and turn right again, I would find Blight and Close. <laughs> you remember Noddy? You remember the famous five? You remember Enid Blyton? She lived at Green Hedges, just round the corner in Penn Road. Sir Terry Patchett a novelist who wrote fantasy fiction, not that I can confess to ever having read any of his books, but he was a local author who went to school in Holtspur and lived in Beaconsfield. And then, of course, we had G.K. Chesterton, who was a writer and a Christian apologist in the 19th century. He wrote over 80 books. And nowadays, he's perhaps most famously known for the TV series of his, of his uh, mysteries based on the Father Brown. You know, the genial Roman Catholic priest who, with the help of his housekeeper, 
M Mrs. McCarthy is able to solve all kinds of mysteries that this beyond the ability of the local priest, a uh, police. On one occasion, when speaking as an apologist, Chester S said this, listen carefully. He said the Christian ideal or the Christian faith has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. I'll say that again. The Christian faith has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. It's a tricky sentence because there are two negatives in it. The Bible says that the gospel leads to godliness. The apostle Paul put it rather differently when writing to Titus. He said, this is a trustworthy saying. No double negatives there. He says, I want you to stress these things. Verse 9 of chapter 3. I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Paul wrote uh, many letters, mainly to churches and to groups of Christians, but he also wrote some personal letters, didn't he? He wrote two letters to his friend Timothy. He wrote to Titus and he wrote to Philemon. And in the New Testament, these short letters are known as the pastoral epistles. Now, Titus was a Greek and he was a Gentile. But he was a trusted and affectionate friend of the apostle. And in verse 4 of chapter 1, which we read, says that he was uh, regarded as his son in the faith. Now, there's no mention of Titus in the book of Acts. His name appears in 2 Corinthians, in Galatians, and in 2 Timothy. But Paul valued the support, and he relied on Titus to act on behalf of him in pastoral work. And in this short letter, he encourages and strengthens Titus in what Paul knew would be a difficult assignment to the church at Crete. Paul had been in Crete and uh, Titus with him. But Paul moves on and he leaves Titus behind. Now the churches in Crete were not all that they ought to be. They were lax, they were indifferent, they were worldly, and they were af affected by the low moral standards of the day. And Paul instructs Titus in verse 5 of chapter 1 that he was to straighten out the difficulties in the church after he had left. And he was to do that by appointing godly men, elders, to the churches on the island because there had uh, come upon the church false teachers. We read that in in verse 10 of chapter 1. Now this letter was no ordinary chatty letter. It wasn't, hi Titus, how are you doing and what's going on? They were very specific instructions that he was giving to this young man. Talking of chatty letters, it's time we started thinking about our Christmas letters, isn't it? and what we're going to say to our friends that we are in touch with only once a year. But Paul was concerned about the truth of the gospel, and he was concerned, and this is the, this is the key to our, uh, our thoughts tonight, 
He was concerned how the blessings of the gospel can be seen all around. Remember, the gospel leads to godliness. It was Francis of Assisi, never call him Saint Francis. It was Francis of Assisi who said, preach the gospel and at all times, where necessary, use words. In other words, Francis was saying, we show forth the gospel not only by what we say, but in our lives. Paul wanted Titus to teach the gospel clearly, not based on the claims propagated by false teachers who had infiltrated the church. There has to be evidence if we claim to be a believer in the Lord Jesus. And whilst the letter was written by Paul, possibly somewhere around about AD 60, the message is as relevant today to us as it was then. What then does Paul say in this letter? Well, he says three things. In chapter 1, he talks about the effect of the gospel in the church. The effect of the gospel in the church. In chapter 2, he talks about the effect of the gospel in the home. And in chapter 3, he talks about the effect of the gospel in the world. I would like us to think particularly about the last of these third groups, the effect of the gospel in the world. But firstly, let's have a quick look at what he says about the gospel in the church and in the home. And in each case, Paul, as was his habit, he sets out doctrine before he goes on to practice. Do you know, there are some elements of the church today who've lost sight of the fundamental truths of the gospel and are more concerned with adapting and reaching out to the world on its own terms. Let me show you something. An evangelical church, not far from here, Sunday night, for £10, you can go to a curry supper. You can have comedy and magic instead of the evening service. Are we reaching out to the world with comedy and magic and a curry supper? I'm all for a curry supper. <laughs> but let us not follow the pattern of this world at the expense of Scripture. I found that very sobering. Very sobering indeed. But we do have to reach out. We do have to build bridges with society. I was reading only this week. I get the, the prayer uh, letter from uh, London City Mission about the creative ways in which they reach out to society. I was reading this morning of uh, 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 one of the missioners who started a music academy for the young people. Another one had started a soccer school. I have a friend who works in inner London and teaches English classes to Muslims. P churches have lunch clubs. There are hundreds of ways in which we can build the bridge with society, but not at the expense of the gospel. The effect of the gospel in the church. Paul introduces himself at the beginning of the letter. You know, it's much more sensible to put your name at the beginning of a letter than at the end. Who wants to read two or three pages to find who it's from? You might recognize the handwriting, in which case that doesn't matter. But uh, Titus, uh, 
the introduction, uh, which was rather long for Paul, is only exceeded by his letter to the Romans. In verse 1, he says, he gives us his reason for becoming a bondservant or a slave, as he says in the NIV. Uh, uh, um, a servant, he says. A Paul, a servant of God. Uh, the thought there is that of a bondservant. Uh, and he says that through the preaching of the gospel, it will nurture the faith of the believers and the knowledge of the truth as it leads to godliness. See that? He says, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Now here are two fundamental characteristics that Paul feels are essential. Faith and knowledge. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Knowledge of God, as revealed by the Holy Spirit through the word of God, is the foundation of faith. Think about that. Knowledge of God, revealed by the Holy Spirit through the word of God, is the foundation of faith. As I've got older, I think more and more about the greatness and majesty of God. But how can I, with a finite mind, understand an infinite God? A God who, on the one hand, creates the heavens, and we're still investigating, aren't we, with the latest telescopes and rockets and what have you. And yet, I've just been reading um, uh, uh, the book uh, on the development of the atom bomb, Robert Oppenheimer. And he was interested in atomic physics, the finest, smallest particles of the atom. It's the same God that creates the universe. Now, I can't grasp that with my mind. But I trust the word of God by faith. So the knowledge of the truth, that's here, and faith are two fundamental characteristics that Paul brings to the attention of this young man. Knowledge of God by the Holy Spirit is the foundation of faith. I'm reminded of um, <coughs> uh, an occasion many years ago when... Uh, and my wife and I went to a talk somewhere in Oxfordshire. Somebody had a big house and they uh, put up a, a, a tent and it was a, it was a Christian meeting and they had invited the theologian Michael Green. Michael Green was a, a well-known theologian many years ago and uh, he was uh, 75 and he had been... Uh, involved as a minister of the gospel for 50 years and they asked him it wasn't he wasn't preaching he was it was just to give a talk on his uh, autobiography of 50 years serving the lord and uh, very interesting talk uh, but sitting at the back there were some um, some um, students from the university some theology students and he took questions at the end um and they, they said to him, uh, uh, Mr. Green, it seems that you are less certain now what you believe than 50 years ago. And he said, well, you might be right, but I'm more certain in whom I believe. In other words... He was more certain about God and the characteristics of God than understanding all the details, if you see. His vision and his sight was on the Lord. Now you remember the old song, Love and Marriage. 
both go together like a horse and carriage, first sung by Frank Sinatra in 1955. That's exactly it. Truth and faith. You cannot have faith without knowing the truth, and truth strengthens your faith. We better move on. In chapter 2, Paul sees the effect of the gospel in the home. In chapter 1, it was the effect of the gospel in the church. In chapter 2, the effect of the gospel in the home. And Paul begins a new section by reminding Titus that he must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. That, of course, begs the question, what is sound doctrine? And the English Standard Version says that it is healthy doctrine, doctrine which hasn't been tainted, which is wholesome, and which has not been polluted by the unhealthy teaching of the deceivers who had infiltrated the church. And he then expresses, and time doesn't permit to go into it, what must be taught to the various members of the home to older women, to older men, to younger women, and to slaves. And he says that in verses, let's just read them in verses two, uh, tw uh, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Remember, the gospel leads to godliness. Likewise, if we say we must say no to ungodliness, that's the converse, isn't it? So in chapter 1, he's concerned about truth and faith, in chapter 2, he moves on to the wider concerns about the effect of the gospel in the homes and in individual lives and how our lives should be characterized by godliness as we wait, he says, for the Lord's return. Finally, having talked about the effect of the gospel in the church and then in the home, he moves on to the effect of the gospel in the world. He tells us in verse 1 that we should be subject to earthly authorities. And then Paul moves on to what I think are deeply moving verses. He begins by reminding Titus that we, he says we, and he includes himself, we were no different from the unsaved. We were foolish, we were disobedient, we were deceived, we were enslaved to sin. And then, and then we have this wonderful, wonderful verse. It, it, it sent a shiver up my spine when I was reading it recently. He says in verse 3 of chapter 3, we were dis disobedient, deceived, and enslaved, lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us. You know, it's only a three-letter word, but it's a wonderful, wonderful word, but but God. Now, if you want to study, study the phrase, but God. Just those two words, but God. Think of Noah. Despite the rampant evil in the days of Noah, much akin to what we have today, when God regretted that he had made man and he intended to flood the earth, we read, but God, but God remembered Noah, who became an heir 
of righteousness. The gospel leads to godliness and righteousness. Think of Joseph. Hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, alleged rape of Potiphar's wife, the sale of Joseph to the Midianite traders seemed an absolute, utter disaster. Or was it? Genesis 50 verse 10 says, But God meant it for good and for the salvation of Jacob and his family. We could go on, but one more. 1 Samuel chapter 23. David is hounded from pillar to post by King Saul. He finally thinks he's got him cornered in the city of Keilah. And in the heat of the chase, the odds are against him. But we're told in 1 Samuel 23, verse 14, day after day, it says that Saul uh, searched for David, but God did not give David into his hand. Back to Titus. Paul says he identifies with the believers. He describes them just as society is today. And then he says, but God. You know, we live in a world that has turned its back on God, which tells us We'll make our own minds up. I'm the one that matters, not God. I'll decide my future. I'll decide how to live my life. In fact, I'll decide whether I'm a man or a woman. It's insanity, isn't it? It's unbelievable that the God of this world has deceived people. But Paul says that he was like that. But then these glorious, wonderful verses that because of the three extraordinary attributes of God, his kindness and his love and his mercy. He says, we're saved not because we deserve it, not because we earned it, not because we tried hard, not because we're better educated, not because we go to church or even go to the prayer meeting or watch songs of praise. We are saved because of the kindness and love of God. Doesn't that thrill you? It thrills me through and through. And so, in these final verses, Paul packs in at least five wonderful, glorious truths about salvation. He gives us the need of salvation. He says we are reminded that we were foolish and disobedient. We were deceived. We were caught in the devil's trap. He tells us about the source of our salvation. You know, the New Age teaching encourages us to believe that we have the possibility for self-improvement. For self-salvation, they say that, that we can overcome the problems of life as we discover our inner self. Paul says, no, salvation is a unilateral, unilateral demonstration of God's kindness, love and mercy. He tells us the need, he tells us the source, he tells us the means of salvation. The means of God's salvation is not within ourselves and our ability to develop our inner self. It is that Christ Jesus, the Son of God, came as Saviour of the world and died on the cross for our sin. How does God save us? Not by patching up a broken life, by recreating us and giving us a new life, a new birth, in the spirit, in verse 5 of chapter 3, it says, by renewal of the Holy Spirit. And when he writes to the churches in Corinth, Paul says, therefore, if anyone be in Christ, 
They are a new creation, a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. The life which Adam had in the Garden of Eden was a physical life and a spiritual life. And the spiritual life died when sin entered in the world. But we can have new life in the spirit through our Lord Jesus. The source, the means, the reason for our salvation. So that we who had no hope in the world, we who were estranged from God, the apostle says, cannot save ourselves, but we become heirs of God and have hope of eternal life. And then the evidence. Paul reminds Titus what he said at the very beginning in verse 1, that the truth and the knowledge of Christ leads to godliness. In fact, he says here in chapter 3, I want you to stress that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Throughout the centuries, since Paul wrote this letter to Titus, believers have lived selfless lives of faith, doing what is good and demonstrating that the gospel leads to godliness. I have another little pamphlet here from the London City Mission. It is full of stories of changed lives. Full, amazing testimonies of what God has done in the lives of men and women. G.K. Chesterton was not quite right. The Christian faith has been tried but it has not been found wanting. Christ changes lives. May the Lord enable all of us to do what is good and to demonstrate our faith in the world in which we live. Amen. Just in case you are watching us on YouTube and you would like to know more about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, just contact us at Chartridge Mission Church. You'll find us, if you Google, you'll find the website, and you can call us or write to us at Chartridge Mission Church, Chesham Box, HP5 2TH. We would love to hear from you.